Hey there everybody and welcome to this presentation on depression types, symptoms, effects, and recovery strategies. I'm your host, Dr. Donnelly Snipes. In this presentation, we're going to review the various types of depression from major depressive disorder to seasonal affective disorder, the symptoms, how those symptoms impact the individual, potential causes of those symptoms, and then we'll touch on some strategies for recovery. There are a lot of different types of depression. The most, the one we're most familiar with is major depressive disorder. And for this one, the person has to have clinically significant symptoms for at least two weeks. Persistent depressive disorder, on the other hand, is often called high functioning depression. It goes on for about two years. Now, persistent depressive disorder can also be diagnosed in somebody who has um, sporadic episodes of major depressive disorder. But the key here with persistent depressive disorder is it's something that this person has been dealing with for a really freaking long time. Premenstrual dysphoric disorder is another um, depressive syndrome that we have in the DSM. And they also have depression due to a general medical condition. So when you're looking at, you know, what kind of depression do I have? If you really want to have a diagnosis or figure out what your diagnosis is, those are the ones that you're generally going to be looking at. You also have depression that is unspecified. Within this category, we have seasonal affective disorder, which is depression that comes on for people, especially during the winter months when the days are shorter, when they're inside more, or in areas where there's a whole lot of rain and very little sunshine. Postpartum depression, well, we know what causes that one, and grief and bereavement. You can have major depressive disorder and grief at the same time. It's important to remember that depression is part of the grieving process. So, you know, understanding what is causing your symptoms, I think is a lot more important than trying to figure out exactly which diagnosis you have. If you feel depressed, then let's figure out what's causing it and then evaluate some strategies that might help you address it. It's also important to remember that depression, a lot of people think of people who are depressed being slow and fatigued and depressed. But some people who have depression also have anxious distress. They're also very anxious on top of that. Um, so there is an anxious distress qualifier if the person doesn't meet the criteria for generalized anxiety disorder at the same time. Symptoms of depression, and this is what I call the primary effects of depression. And they are going to be significantly more intense during a major depressive episode. But depressed mood, most of the time, most days. Markedly diminished interest or pleasure in, in most activities, most of the time, most days. Now, in order to qualify for depression, you have to have one or both of those during the two week or two year period. All right, then in addition to at least one of those, you need to have four of the following symptoms. 5% or greater change in weight or a change in appetite. That can mean having a greater appetite or a less, less appetite, but 5% change. Now for the average person, that's only, you know, about seven to 10 pounds. Observable slowing of thought and movement. And this is when it feels like you're sort of walking through mud or walking into a really heavy headwind and other people can see it. They can see that it takes you longer to do things than it did when you were not struggling with depression. Now that's different than fatigue or loss of energy. When we're, when we have slowing of thought and movement, it's just, it takes a lot longer for things to happen. And for the person experiencing it, like I said, it feels like you're working through mud. Uh, fatigue and loss of energy is just being plumb tired. You're exhausted, you want to sleep. 
feelings of worthlessness or excessive or inappropriate guilt now this can cause depression but it also can be a uh, side effect if you will but it's also obviously a symptom of depression because a lot of times when people feel depressed they can't do the things that they expect themselves to do they don't they can't do the things that they think they quote should be doing so they start feeling extremely guilty and worthless there's a diminished ability to think or concentrate or indecisiveness well when people stop sleeping effectively their brain is not able to clear out something called adenosine which makes it harder to concentrate when they're tired when they're depressed when they just feel hopeless and helpless yeah it's hard to think or concentrate because dopamine norepinephrine uh, are low adenosine is high makes sense and possibly recurrent thoughts of death or suicidal ideation now if you are currently experiencing these thoughts it's important to stop watching the video and call 911 or you can go to opencounseling.com suicide dash hotlines to find a list of uh, suicide prevention hotlines not only in the U.S. but also internationally so now that we've looked at the diagnostic characteristics of depression let's look at some of the secondary effects some of the things that didn't actually make it into the diagnostic manual but we see frequently co-occur with people who have depression physically they experience an increase in pain now our pain perception is partly controlled by the neurotransmitter serotonin so when serotonin's out of whack we may feel more pain additionally when people are depressed a lot of times they're not moving as much and they may be sleeping a lot more which can cause aches and pains and those sorts of things circadian rhythm alterations is another physical aspect when people are sleeping at all hours of the day when they're tired especially if they're not getting quality sleep when they do sleep it could alter their circadian rhythms which alters virtually everything else in the body from your sex hormones to your appetite to your energy levels um, so circadian rhythm disruptions can be a significant uh, problem for people with depression and that can compound their depression this is often when I work with people with depression one of the first places that we look how can we stabilize your circadian rhythms to help your body kind of get back into into a rhythm and gastrointestinal disturbances are also very frequent when people are depressed they often are more constipated than they are having having other problems but these GI disturbances uh, correspond again to changes in different neurotransmitter levels including serotonin but also correspond to reduced movement when you are not moving your body around um, when your uh, metabolism is a little bit lower um, sometimes when you're eating food that's low in fiber all of those things can happen when somebody's depressed and it can cause uh, disruption of the gastrointestinal tract additionally uh, there is has been shown in the research on repeated occasions that people who are experiencing depression often have a change in the gut microbiome in the bacteria that's in their gut that is supposed to help make neurotransmitters and everything that changes when they are experiencing depression partly because of stress partly because of um, nutritional changes there there are several reasons it happens but that can also contribute to gastrointestinal distress for those things for physical things it's important to uh, talk to your doctor about what can I do to manage this particular symptom or effect of what I'm going through so it doesn't compound my feelings of hopelessness helplessness and guilt affectively 
I've already mentioned guilt a couple of times. Guilt is a huge one that people with depression often experience. So it's going to be important to process your core beliefs about the guilt and also recognize that holding on to guilt, being angry at yourself for not being able to do these things while you're depressed is only going to compound that depression and make it harder to recover. It's kind of like grabbing onto an anchor when you're trying to swim. I have a lot of videos on the YouTube channel on uh, coping with guilt. So you may explore that, explore it with your therapist. Grief is another thing that people experience that kind of goes along with guilt when they are uh, depressed. They may be grieving the fact that they are not able to do what they want to do. They may be grieving the fact that they're not the same feeling like the same person that they were six months or a year ago. They may be grieving the fact that they can't um, do things that they want to do. So grief because of the depression is a secondary effect and we need to help people identify this and, and work through that grief. And then anger and anger in people who are depressed can be caused by a variety of things. They can be angry about the fact that they're depressed. They can be angry at others or jealous of others who are not depressed. They can be angry at others who don't understand or who minimize their depression. And they may just tend to be more irritable because they're depressed and they can't process, they don't have the energy to process other people's stuff and to be polite and all those things. So they may tend to be more um, irritable with other people. They just can't take anymore. They don't have the energy to deal with it. Cognitively, people who are depressed tend to have perceptions that are more negative. When we are not happy, our brain pays more attention to the threats in the environment to keep us safe while we're feeling depressed, angry, or anxious. Our brain is saying, all right, you're not on your A game right now. So let me make sure that nothing else happens. Unfortunately, that makes us focus even more on potential threats in the environment, which can make us feel like the world is even darker and bleaker than we thought before. And it can be this downward spiral. Combined with that, you know, if you're tired and it feels like it takes 10 times more energy to do anything that it, than it did before you were depressed, um, and then you start seeing the world as a bleaker uh, place to be in, that can really sap motivation, not only for recovery, but doing anything. It's like, what's the point? So we do need to evaluate uh, motivation and help people enhance their motivation for the recovery process because recovery is not easy especially when it already takes 10 times more energy to do stuff and you have no energy and you're exhausted when we start asking people to do things to address their recovery it may feel completely overwhelming so we need to make sure that we're helping them um, increase and maintain their motivation set small very small achievable goals and and take as any steps necessary that they need in order to help them get the get up and go to start making those positive steps forward. Environmentally, people who are depressed may struggle with finances because they are too depressed to go to work. Um, they may be buying things to try to make them feel better, which can also contribute to financial difficulties. And then they get the bill and they feel overwhelmed. They're like, oh crap, what did I do? And that can contribute to even more stress and compound the depression. Housing for some can be an issue. If their finances start to go wonky, then the stress of losing their housing can be a problem. Organization. When people are depressed, one of the last things that most people people want to do is worry about cleaning the house, doing laundry, those sorts of things. So the, their environment may become increasingly more disheveled or chaotic. Often my experience has been that people's outside environment, their immediate outside environment often reflects how they feel on the inside. 
And if their outside environment says, I just, I can't even, that tells me what they may be experiencing on the inside. And their activities of daily living, including work, uh, may also start struggling. People who are depressed often have difficulty finding energy to get up and take a bath. They have difficulty getting the energy to, you know, uh, make themselves healthy meals. And if they are able to go to work, like people with persistent depressive disorder, uh, they may be struggling to get through the day. They may not be as productive as they were before they were depressed, which can Im impact their evaluations and potentially put them at risk of losing their job. So we do want to recognize depression isn't just a feeling here. Um, depress well, I'll get into that in a minute. Relationally, people who are experiencing clinical depression often have uh, negative impacts on their self-esteem. They start feeling bad because of that guilt and uh, that sense of hopelessness and helplessness or worthlessness. Um, they may start telling themselves that they are worthless, that they are bad people. So we need to really uh, help people understand depression as a alteration in multiple systems, not only the way they think, not only with their activities, but also the way their body is functioning, their neurotransmitters, their hormones, all those things are also out of whack. It's not just something they can wish away. Uh, and we need to help them understand that they're doing the best they can at any point in time. And finally, their relationships with others may suffer. When a person is depressed, they really don't have a lot of energy. They barely have a lot of energy, enough energy to take care of themselves that they don't have a lot of energy left to focus on, you know, going out with friends, nurturing relationships. They may have difficulty with even connecting with people in their own household, including their children. So attachment issues can start to develop um, as a result of depression. People who are depressed sometimes feel abandoned after a while if they're not able to recover when other people don't know what to do or start distancing themselves. The person with depression may also feel abandoned and that may impair their attachment uh, to others. And their attitude may also impact their relationships because they have so little energy. They may have a lot less tolerance for other things. They may not have enough energy to empathize with others. So as I mentioned earlier, they may tend to be a little bit more irritable, which can be off-putting to a lot of people. So we've talked about the diagnostic criteria, some of the secondary symptoms of uh, depression. Now, what causes it? Well, <laughs> I wish I could say we knew what caused it for any one person, and it's but it's different for any one person. Hormone changes, your sex hormones, your, thi um, your, your uh, testosterone, your estrogen, those naturally decline as we age and they can contribute low levels of um, estrogen or testosterone can contribute to feelings of depression. Also, anything else that may be altering those, the levels of those sex hormones can affect mood. Thyroid hormones. When we, uh, at, there are a lot of people who struggle with hypothyroid, low thyroid, and low thyroid is associated with feelings of depression. That's one of the most common um, things that doctors will assess for. If a patient presents as depressed, they will do blood work to assess thyroid levels. Sleep deprivation. Now this can be due to not being able to get quality sleep because you're crying all the time, because you just can't sleep, you've got insomnia, because you've got sleep apnea. Um, whatever the case, whatever is causing you not to get adequate quality sleep, that is triggering your threat response system or your HPA axis, and it can actually cause an alteration in your 
neurotransmitters and contribute to the development of depression. Good quality sleep is really important. Nutritional deficiencies are also associated with depression. And we know that uh, anemia, so lack of sufficient iron, can contribute to feelings of depression. Uh, but we also need to recognize that other vitamins and minerals are necessary for the body to take the food that we eat and break it down and make the hormones and neurotransmitters that help us feel happy. So if you're eating crap, you're probably going to feel like crap. Um, eating reasonably, uh, you can learn online. You can go to the um, USDA. You can go to a variety of different websites to learn about basic healthy eating. I've also got videos on the website about uh, nutrition and how it impacts mood to give you a little bit of awareness of steps you might take to improve your nutrition. You don't have to, you know, go crazy and eat a super quote clean diet, uh, but it's making sure that you're getting the essential nutrients. Medication side effects can also contribute to feelings of depression. Medications that are slowing opioids um, and, and other medications can cause feelings of depression. So check with, uh, you can go on um, uh, drugs.com and look at medication side effects and find out are any of the medications you're taking associated with um, depression. Chronic pain can also contribute to depression. Chronic pain prevents people from getting good quality sleep. It keeps that threat response system, you know, hyped up a little bit. When people are in pain, they, they tend to be more stressed. All of that can combine to alter your hormones and neurotransmitters and contribute to feelings of depression, hopelessness, helplessness, apathy, lack of motivation, you know, all of those things we commonly associate with depression. Another thing I don't have on here, and I did mention it on the first slide, is general medical conditions. People who have um, chronic obstructive uh, pulmonary disease or other cardiovascular diseases may also struggle with depression if they're not getting enough oxygen. So it's really important if you're not feeling well, if you're feeling depressed, get a physical there are a lot of things that present as depression that may be very easily addressed through medical intervention. Affectively, if a person is not able to effectively identify, tolerate, and modulate their emotions, then that can contribute to depression. If they feel like they're just constantly emotionally out of control, that can contribute to a sense of hopelessness and helplessness and let's face it exhaustion if you don't feel like you're in control of your emotions so a low emotional intelligence uh, can contribute to people's feelings of lack of control over their emotions but people who have experienced trauma or who are experiencing chronic stress may also have a um, condition, if you will, called emotional dysregulation. And this occurs uh, most often as a result of that threat response system, that HPA axis, getting um, out of calibration. And the person's just stressed for too long and the body says, we cannot deal with this much stress. We can not deal with this much anxiety for, you know, this long. The body can't run this hot. So I'm going to dial down my responsiveness. So most of the time the person feels flat or depressed, but occasionally when the threat is big enough, they may what we call dysregulate. So they go from being flat to furious. They're either enraged or they're terrified. There is no middle ground. They are either, you know, not really feeling much of anything or they're feeling depressed or they have this tsunami of excitatory neurochemicals and they start feeling really intense emotions and that's exhausting too. As I mentioned before, grief, part of the grieving process is depression. So 
when people are grieving, we, we expect them to be going through depression for a period of time. Anxiety, as I mentioned with dysregulation, if somebody is chronically anxious, they have generalized anxiety disorder or post-traumatic stress where they're constantly hypervigilant and not feeling safe, feeling anxious, then they may ultimately experience that those brain changes that result in dysregulation. Their brain says, you know what? I can't, I just, I don't have any more energy left to give you. So the person may start feeling out of gas, depressed over it, um, powerless and anger itself or others, anxiety and anger are our fight or flight chemicals. So or fight or flight, uh, emotions. So when somebody is feeling chronically anxious or angry, that means that threat response system is chronically um, on and that is exhausting. The body will not do that for an extended period of time. Eventually the, the over overlords in your brain will say, you know what? We can't run this hot. We can't be continuing to expend this much energy all the time. So depression sets in. Cognitively, outdated schema or our memories, our shortcuts that help us anticipate what to expect in different situations and from different people, those are called schema, that can influence our perceptions in the present. So if we have um, an expectation of people to behave in a certain way based on prior experiences, then we may anticipate people in the future behaving in that same way and sometimes even create a self-fulfilling prophecy and cause that in others. So one of the strategies in cognitive behavioral therapy is identifying the schema, the expectations of people, places, events, and then checking them, comparing them to what you expect versus what are the facts in this context at this point in time. Thinking errors can also cause depression. And a lot of times our thinking errors were formed when we were young and they've just always gone unchecked. We have never uh, addressed our use of extreme words like always or never. We haven't um, addressed thinking errors like personalization. Nobody's ever told us, hey, you know, is that really accurate? So negative thinking styles, thinking errors uh, can contribute significantly to perceiving the world as being a threatening place, which can contribute to people developing a sense of hopelessness, helplessness, and depression. And a lack of effective coping skills. We are not born with coping skills. You know, we kind of learn them on the job. And especially if somebody grew up in an environment in which they did not have a primary caregiver who was able to teach them effective coping skills, they may not have developed them. So when they start feeling these intense emotions, they may not know how to cope with them, which, so then the emotion almost run, runs ripshod over them and they feel overwhelmed and exhausted and helpless. Environmentally, unsafe or stressful environments that prevent sleep or relaxation can contribute to depression. We all need a place where we can feel safe and empowered and we can just relax. And if we can't, that means that threat response system is still on high alert, scanning for threats, and that is draining our energy and exhausting us. Lack of access to medical care can be another cause of depression. If people have undiagnosed problems like cardiovascular disease or diabetes or chronic pain that's keeping them up at night, but they can't afford medical care or they can't afford their medications, then that can go on to spiral and start impacting their mood. And financial and housing stressors. We need to feel safe. We need to have a roof over our head and know that we're going to be able to have healthy food in our bellies. And when that doesn't happen, the stress of that 
can contribute to depression and not having the ability to relax or, um, or not having access to healthy food can also contribute greatly to depression. And relationally, trauma can result in a, a sense of isolation. You know, I don't trust anybody and a lack of ability to trust others to help them and not hurt them. And this trauma can be from, um, insecure attachment in childhood. It can be from uh, attachment disruption in, you know, other relationships, or it can be from a particular event, like you're a survivor of crime, or you experienced a, a natural disaster. And as a result of that trauma and your interactions with others, it left you feeling uh, unsafe around other people. And that can be really, really exhausting because then you feel like you are out there, you're alone and you're having to deal with the entire world by yourself because you can't trust anybody else. And you're always surrounded by people. So you're always, guess what? Hypervigilant. You're also always scanning, almost anticipating using those schema from the trauma, anticipating people to do wrong. Low self-esteem is another cause of depression. Sometimes people grow up with what we call conditions of worth. Their caregivers tell them they're only lovable for what they do, not for who they are. And if they don't feel like they're successful enough, if they don't feel like they are enough, then that can contribute to a sense of low self-esteem, worthlessness, unlovability, guilt, depression. A lack of social support can also contribute to depression because sometimes the world really hands us a lot more than any one person can handle. And when that happens, it can feel overwhelming and oppressive. And if the individual doesn't feel like they've got any support anywhere, it can leave them feeling unsafe, hopeless, and helpless, which eventually usually manifests as depression. And grief and loss. I know I've mentioned it several times, but in relationships, uh, we may experience depression uh, when we lose people that are important to us. Mental health is something everybody deserves. Due to the growth of this channel, I'm devoting more of my time to the YouTube channel instead of taking on new patients. Please consider supporting the channel by becoming a member. And as always, like, subscribe, and share. You can share with friends, family, or even your doctor, your pastor, or your human resources department. Depression is a natural reaction to a loss or a situation which leaves you feeling helpless and hopeless. Depression has a significant impact on the individual as well as those around them, including family, friends, and even employers. Depression is often a result of multiple factors, but an improvement in any one area can have positive effects on every other area. Explore different strategies to address your depression at docsnipes.com depression. This takes you to a YouTube playlist for some of my top tips for dealing with depression.